Restless Mind with David Dillard Wright, the podcast that takes you into a space of tranquility, abundance, and freedom. The guided meditations and bonus content that you are about to hear will remove worry from your life and help you to release obstacles on your path. Learn key insights from philosophy, spirituality, and psychology to support your journey to greater mindfulness and well-being. Now is the time to open your heart and mind to Boundless Inspiration. Hello, I'm David Dillard Wright. Welcome to The Boundless Mind. We'll be talking about some ways to help you live a calm, centered, and abundant life. Today's show is all about the living tradition. Each show we begin with a brief meditation, and then we will talk about the topic for the day. Today's meditation comes from A Mindful Day, my newest book, and it's called A Quiet Darkness. For those of you who have the physical book, it's on page 74. We begin with an affirmation. I set aside my longing for the praise of others. I set aside my longing for power and possessions. I want only to sit in darkness and unfold the mystery of my heart's true desire. I took birth for this moment, for this place, and this time. Why wait any longer? Dwell now in the realization of what you have always wanted to be. Stop looking for external rewards and confirmations. Know your true nature deep inside yourself. Once you have this realization, no one will be able to take it away from you. You may lose sight of it from time to time, but your inner divinity will still be present, glowing like a hot coal on the hearth of the heart. You cause your own sadness by turning away from your innate divinity, by seeking satisfaction from worldly things and the praise of other people. Know the truth for yourself, and you will no longer need the latest fad to make you feel better temporarily. As you shut your eyes and breathe deeply, the thoughts begin to subside. They become less frantic and insistent. A quiet darkness descends. Rather than run away from that darkness, sit with it. Recognize your troubles as the conjurings of your own mind. Sit there as long as you can. Find the one true desire of your heart and speak only that into the void. Will yourself to realize your highest vision. That's the end of the meditation. I invite you to pause the recording here for a few minutes of silent contemplation. Today's talk is called The Living Tradition. This is the next in our Nine Gates series. And if you haven't heard the other episodes in this series, I'd recommend you go back to them before you listen to this one. We're on the second rank in the Nine Gates system. This one is called Sadak or Sadaka. And in these lessons, we're concentrating on the qualities of generosity, forbearance, patience, and contentment. A Sadak or Sadaka is one who takes the most efficient means to realization, one who has left behind the beginning stages and is firmly and decisively committed to the spiritual path. Confused and wavering consciousness departs, leaving only the sure, strong steps of self-discipline. The gemstone for this rank is citrine. The living tradition. At this stage in your journey, you've been touched by many types of suffering. As a seeker for truth, you have ached for the people around you as they suffered want, depression, anxiety, and physical distress. You've had your share of burdens in your own life. Sometimes your spirituality has seemed a burden in itself, as it is more difficult to live a life of compassion and wisdom than to blindly follow the crowd. Often, you kept vigil all alone, as those around you did not understand your craving for the spiritual life. You lost relationships with loved ones simply because they couldn't understand your need for meditation and silence. You bravely forged ahead, not knowing if or when your journey would ever come to an end. You have now found a sure guide on your journey to liberation in the form of the gurus of the lineage, the teachings that they impart, and the community to which you now belong. 
the triple braided cord of scriptural understanding, communion with your teachers, and practices of worship leads you forward into your future as a realized being. This cord keeps its connection to the past, not in a merely memorial way, but as a living tradition. We believe that the saints, the gurus, the sages who have gone before us do not exist merely as characters and nice stories from the past. Rather, they actively look out for this community and speak to the present concerns of devotees. If we place an image of Ramakrishna or Sarada Ma, if we place an image of Sri Ma of Kamakya or Swami Satyananda Saraswati, and if we pray to that image, we believe that answers will appear. The gurus of the lineage do not do all of the work for us. They cannot say the mantras for us, they cannot create a home shrine for us, and they cannot earn a decent living for us. But they can and do provide us with inspiration along the way, whether or not they reside in a physical body. They can show us the resources at our disposal, the means that we didn't know we had. Their blessings do make a difference in our lives. The syllable gu means shadows or darkness, and the syllable ru means dispersing or removing. So a guru is one who removes the darkness of ignorance. Our first gurus as children are our mother and father, who prepare us for life in the best way they know how. Next, we have our teachers in school, who teach us to read and write and give us basic knowledge of math, science, literature, and other subjects. If we are very lucky and have enough merit stored over the previous lifetimes, we will have a spiritual guru, a living person who shows the way to liberation. Having a guru means that we no longer have to flounder around on our own, trying on different philosophies and religions. We can stop the preliminary experiments and move on to the work itself. The wavering consciousness departs, the doubt wanes, and the unproductive questioning stops, leaving only the good questioning. The good questioning is the questioning which is directed towards liberation, is directed towards living, thinking, and talking in the most conducive ways that lead to release from bondage. Having a guru means having a guide along the path. Without a guru, we wander aimlessly and unproductively. Having a guru means that we have someone to answer our questions, someone who speaks from experience and not mere ceremony. Another aspect of the guru-shisha or guru-disciple relationship is that the disciple does not actually relinquish responsibility to the guru. Swamiji points out most helpfully that the word for grace in Sanskrit is kripa, which means do and get. The guru can perform sadhana on behalf of the devotees, but eventually the devotees must learn to stand on their own two feet, so to speak. They must take up the practices themselves and internalize them. They must act on their own wisdom and intention, following the teachings of the guru in a creative, active way. The disciple must make every effort to become a cause of satisfaction to the guru. And that's a quotation from the Guru Gita, verse 27. But this must be done not in a slavish, robotic way, but out of a place of creative spirituality, as a full and responsible adult with many gifts and capacities. The disciples must always give more than they take, for to do so is to continue the living tradition. But they still need to live their own lives, except in the rare case of the one who has attained complete renunciation and taken monastic vows. In the Dharmic traditions, the idea of a vicarious salvation through some sort of savior figure doesn't work, because the disciple must be transformed into the image of the guru. When the idea of enlightenment becomes too passive, the devotees become lazy and worldly, and the dharma is not upheld. The many scandals that have been used to attack the dharmic traditions, cases where well-known gurus have become involved in financial and sexual abuse, 
have occurred because of a failure to understand the true nature of the guru-disciple relationship. In the eternal way of dharma, we respect the guru as God, but we also believe that each disciple, given enough training and experience, given a significant ordeal of purification, will eventually attain to the state of liberation, either in this lifetime or the next. In other words, the nature of the guru's heart is the nature of every heart. We are all divine beings who pray to divine beings with the hopes that divinity will reach its highest and most complete expression. We are not changing darkness into light, sinner into saved. We are bringing fullness to fullness, light to light. The true devotee is not made servile by prostrating him or herself at the Guru's feet. Rather, through service, through giving, the devotee is crowned with glory and made complete. The devotee becomes godlike by serving the gods, by serving the Guru. And yet the devotee must preserve a sense of responsibility, a sense of uniqueness, a sense of having an individuality that is valuable to the satsanga and the lineage. The proper guru-disciple relationship comes about when the guru seeks nothing other than the continued progress of the devotees. And the devotees, in return, do things to make the guru's life easier by taking care of the few material needs that the guru has. In the ideal relationship, neither guru nor shishya lacks for anything. It is sometimes said that the disciple who takes initiation should no longer follow any teachings except those imparted by the lineage. It is certainly true that the devotee bent on liberation should not accept any teachings that conflict with the teachings of the guru. If some other spiritual teaching is harmonious with the guru's teaching and does not diminish it, it seems that the pagan rule, and it harm none, do what thou wilt, should suffice. But outside teachings should only be pursued if one is keeping the spiritual activities prescribed by the lineage. In other words, such teachings should not be a replacement for the Guru's instruction. Otherwise, the relationship is broken, and we find ourselves back at square one. Many followers of the eternal Dharma, otherwise known as Hinduism, find elements in common with paganism and pantheism, as these earth-centered traditions are closer to the root religion of humankind. Similarly, Hindus almost never take issue with modern science, since the belief in cyclical time does not conflict with scientific cosmology. Hindus easily take scientific findings in stride, as nothing in science conflicts with the Dharmic worldview, since it too is based upon cause and effect, action and reaction. Metaphysically speaking, the traditions of Dharma may be polytheistic, animistic, henotheistic, pantheistic, monotheistic, atheistic, or some combination thereof. Having no central authority save the lineage, Hindus can be highly adaptable and resilient. All of this is to highlight the extreme desirability of having a guru and lineage to follow. Such a development catapults one's evolution forward much faster than would ever be achievable on the solitary path. Just behind behaving ethically and following one's duty, the next task should be to find a guru who can guide one across the threshold and into the living tradition. If you do not have a living guru, ask Lord Ganesha to show you the way. If you have trouble committing to a path, ask Ganesha to remove the obstacles that stand in your way. Ask Ganesha to remove the wavering thoughts. Ask Ganesha to still the mind and allow the mind to concentrate on its chosen ideal. Your guru will soon be revealed to you. You will find a pause within cyclical existence, a point of decision in which the fruitless wandering stops and the fruitful wandering begins. As you do this, you must grow in your devotion to Lord Ganesha so that the relationship is more warm and affectionate. To do this, you move beyond recitation of the 108 names and the japa practice that you were doing earlier. 
you begin to practice a short puja or worship ritual to the remover of obstacles. You will find complete instructions in the index to the book at Ganapati's feet. A critically important aspect of your practice is to not expect results right away. Your chanting will not be beautiful at first. You'll have a hard time getting your lamps to light. Something will always go wrong. You can count on it. Just retain your composure and do your best to get through to the end of the puja. There will also be moments of indescribable beauty when a ray of light comes through the window in a certain way, when the deity seems to be looking directly at you, when you receive some new insight. Such things do happen, but resolve to worship whether or not these special experiences come. Resolve to worship whether you feel like it or not, whether or not it is quote-unquote working. You may excuse yourself from puja for major life events, like a death in the family or a serious injury or illness. But do not excuse yourself just for a bad mood. Indeed, puja is the practice most likely to make you feel better. This minor course adjustment in your life will make the greatest difference over time, and you'll become a more kind, patient, loving, and generous person as you carry on the living tradition. So that's the end of this lesson. Uh, there's some assignments at the end. There's two sets of assignments. Um, the first set is just for the general public. The second set is for those who wish to become members of the Heart Chakra Society, the Anahata Chakra Satsanga. Here's the first set of assignments. Number one, were you successful in performing Ganesha Puja over the course of these lessons? If so, what allowed you to succeed? If not, what held you back? Second assignment, what can you do to forward the work of the Anahata Chakra Satsanga and its parent organization, the Devi Mandir? What tasks can you undertake to benefit the living tradition without having to be asked? Next, the questions for self-reflection. If you're interested in moving through the formal system of ranks of the Satsanga, please forward your answers to myself. You can contact me uh, by email or through Twitter. Here's the first one. Before moving to the next lesson, complete a Ganesha Puja at least nine times and record a few notes about the practice. Did you have any breakthroughs? Did you have any misgivings or doubts? Take a photo of your home shrine and send it electronically to the satsanga along with your notes. And here's the second one. When did you first hear about Lord Ganesha? Was it in childhood, perhaps in the home of an Indian family? Did you see Lord Ganesha on a television show or movie? Do you think your earlier experiences could have planted a seed that is now bearing fruit? Why or why not? And there's two books that I mention in this uh, recording. I'll make sure to put those in the show notes. That's it for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find more teachings and meditations at heartchakrasociety.org. Or you can read my Psychology Today blog called Boundless at psychologytoday.com forward slash blog forward slash boundless. You can find me on Twitter at David Dillard Rye. That's at D-A-V-I-D-D-I-L-L-A-R-D-W-R-I. You can find my three-part series of books on meditation, A Mindful Morning, A Mindful Evening, and A Mindful Day on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. Send me your comments and questions, and I will get to them on future shows. Our theme music is by Tommy Rooster, theme voiceover by Kimberly Ash DeVries. Zafir Dar on piano, Hafiz Shabazz Rashid on tabla. That's all for now. Have a mindful day.